Good morning, Tahar Kadosh, Berochim Abaim, to everybody today. A Wednesday, the second day of Sivan, corresponding to the first of June, I believe, right? Yes. The 46th day of the Omer, today's class, today class rather, graciously sponsored by Mr. Clemente Rahamim Ben Rahamu Yakohen, Le'ilui Nishmat, his beloved sister, the Ladis Simha Bat Sarah, that today, Right? is the day of Heras Kara. It atoned to the words of Torah, her beautiful Neshama, Haman Aliyah, in Gan Eden. Amen. Today's class, additionally, graciously sponsored by Yaakov Cohen, Kobe Cohen, and family, in honor of the entire Kahal Kadosh for the celebration of Shavuot coming up in a couple of days. So I'd like to spend just a few minutes about the Omer, because David Amelech is the guest of honor of this week, and we cannot ignore the essence of David, but I'll tell you very quickly some messages of David Amelech. So it says that the essence of kingdom, as much as we refer to David as the king of Israel, but when we say from a Omer perspective, Malchut, kingdom, it actually also connects to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's why Friday night, Shabbat Kodesh, when we come back from the synagogue, how do we begin the Shalom Aleichem? Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem, Malachi Asharet, Malachi Aliyot, Melech Malachi Amelachim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Some people say, Min Melech Malachi Amelachim, really, it's not the discussion of today, but basically when we talk about Hashem, we say Melech Malchea Melachim, the King of Kings. That's why in the High Holiday Prayers or the Selichot Prayers, what do we say? Avinu Malkeno, our Father, our King. So therefore it says, in the Sefira of today, one of the goals that we need to achieve in life, individually and collectively, it's the ways of connecting with the Kadosh Baruch Hu. For example, the land of Israel. This is one topic that is brought up here in the Sefirah of today. It is Israel. We know we just celebrated a few days ago Yom Yerushalayim, all right? Yom Yerushalayim, the mega miracle day that Am Israel was able to go back to Eres Israel, but specifically to Yerushalayim, Aida Kodesh, the Harabai, the Temple Mount, the area where the Beta Mikdash once stood. And the world talks about the miracle of the Six Day War, correct? So it says in the Sefirah of today that that miracle, even though he does not mention this only miracle, but many miracles have been mentioned, that this miracle shows Hashem management of the land of Israel. Even though we see Rashi in the beginning of Perasha Bereshit, the Pasuk says, or Rashi asks, why the Torah begins with the creation of the world? You know, if the whole purpose of the Torah is misvot and ma'asim tovim, why do we need to go back to almost 2,000 years that really there were not many misvot given in the beginning of Bereshit? So Rashi answers to teach us that the entire world belongs to Eres Israel, and specifically Eres Israel. And that's why we say in our daily prayers, what does it mean? May our eyes see the return of Sion. Sion means Yerushalayim. Berahamim. What's the meaning of Berahamim? In compassion. In other words, we want to see the Geula. We want to see the redemption of Am Israel in a peaceful, in an harmonious way. That's the reason why. Uh, even from a Kabbalistic perspective, it's written in the Bitohei Chotam and other Sefarim HaKedoshim that if a person has an opportunity 
to eat food that comes from Eris Israel, he should take advantage of that moment. Why? Because food that comes from Eris Israel automatically carry Kedusha, the sanctity and the holiness of the land. Similar to this statement, we are in the year of Shemitah, correct? The seven year cycle that concludes by Rosh Hashanah. Now, what is the Allah of Shemitah? The Shemitah land, so to speak, goes into recess mode. It goes into a sabbatical year. For a whole year, you cannot work the land. The land goes on a Shabbat mode. But for that same reason, that the sanctity of the land of Israel is a godly level of sanctity, for that reason, you're not allowed not only to commercialize the produce of Shemitah, but you're not allowed to take the produce of Shemitah outside of Israel. You understand this concept? Why? Because Eres Israel has Kedusha. Outside of Israel, there is no Kedusha, although there is Kedusha, but there is a godly element. You know, there is a Pasuk that says, Ene Hashem Literally means, the eyes of Hashem are constantly watching the land of Israel. The Zohar Kadosh explains that every land, every country, has a representative in the heavenly courts. Am Israel and the land of Israel, it goes directly by Hashem, constant supervision. And that's the meaning of this verse. God keeps a watchful eye in the land of Israel. For this reason, occasionally, you hear warnings. Be careful. Costco is selling peppers from Israel. Or tangerines from Israel were found in a certain supermarket. Correct? If you see nowadays any type of produce that means fruit or vegetable from Israel, you're not allowed to eat it. You're not allowed to buy it. Because it has the Kedusha from the sabbatical year of the Shemitah, and once Shemitah permeates the year, no fruit or item can live. I'll tell you what happened many years back in Miami, not in, in Cuba, not in Bahamas, not in Brooklyn, in Miami, Florida. There was a kosher supermarket that was selling wine from Israel, product of the Shemitah year. Guess what? The wine had to be returned, and the pallet had to be disposed of, because you cannot derive benefit from wine of Shemitah outside of Eres Israel. Even in Eres Israel, you're going to see a change. That's the reason why today you cannot just go to Israel and say, oh, let me go to the fruit store in the corner. You must ask, does it have Ashkaha? And by the way, since we're talking about the land of Israel, we need to remember one thing, that fruits and vegetables, let's put Shemitah on the side for today. Any day of the year, you cannot just buy fruits and vegetables in Israel from any store that doesn't have supervision. Exactly. Why? Because you must remove teruma and ma'asem. Like in the time of the Bet HaMikdash, that's the reason why you go to Mahanei Yehuda, for example, and I use Mahanei Yehuda because it's easy to relate to. You see that every fruit and vegetable stand needs to have a supervision. Because if it doesn't have a supervision, guess what? Only you don't buy from that store, or you must do your own separation at home of the remote and ma'asero. And I'm only creating just an awareness to understand the Kedusha of Eres Israel. For this reason, Yom Tovs in Israel are one day. And outside of Israel, 
two days, with the exception of Rosh Hashanah, that the Gemara in Masechet Betza calls it Yoma Alichta, a 48-hour day of celebration in the beginning of the year. That's the reason why it says, pray for Eres Israel. You know, we pray for Israel, we pray for our brethren in Israel, and let's be honest here. Eres Israel need be Isurin. The Gemara writes that when a person decides, and this is being told to me by people who make Aliyah to Israel, that when a person makes Aliyah to Israel, there is an adjustment period. It's not automatic. I'm coming from America, open the doors for me. I'm coming from America. Okay? Forget about it. You're not in America. You're in Israel. And there is a concept from the Gemara that there is a certain price to pay to move to Eres Israel. Why? Because it's not just a moving to Israel. You're coming to the palace of the king. You're coming to the place where the Shekhinah is roaming freely. That's why the Gemara writes, Avira de Israel Mahkima. What does it mean? The air of Israel, it activates the brain cells of the person. Another statement says, Arba'a Amot, you walk four steps in Israel, it's a zahut by itself, which is one of the issues that happened between Yaakov and Isaac. When Yaakov left Israel, he was concerned because Isaac, while he was outside of Israel, Isaac not only was fulfilling he himself personally, the mitzvah of honoring his parents, Isaac and Rivka, but guess what? He was living in Eres Israel. Ishub Eres Israel. You know what is attributed to David Amelia, the Gemara writes? That it's better to live in Israel. Be'ir Sherubam Goim. It is better to live in Israel in a city that is the majority of the residents are Goim than to live outside of Israel where the majority of the residents are Yehudim. And this is a sample. If you want to see the real version, call it that the Hutzalaris, Elo Abel Abodah Zara, the Gemara writes. Heavy. I'm not going to translate that, not to change anybody's plans. But basically, basically, and actually there is a Pasuk from David Melech, but I don't remember the Pasuk at this time. But that's what the Gemara quotes as a source. And it says that in Eres Israel, I'm going to say this may sound funny, is a local phone call. When you are in Israel, you feel the Kedusha. At the end of the day, we go to Israel. We haven't been in Israel for three years, thanks to COVID and company, right? But by Zed Hashem, hopefully we go soon. I don't know when, but uh, my Neshama, it's already asking for it for a while. Uh, but anyways, what do you do when you go to Israel? You go to the Kotel, right? You go to places of history. You go to Hebron, you go to Kebel Ahel, you go to Kebarim HaKedoshim. What do you think when I go to Israel I do? I don't think that I even eat a falafel when I'm in Israel. Maybe one from Moshe Falafel in the corner, in Geruda. Okay, maybe one to say I had a falafel. But what do you think when I go to Israel besides visiting a family and hachamim, etc.? Mekomot HaKedoshim. We go to Hebron, we go to the Biakiba, we go to Meron, we go to places of Kedusha. That's, that, that's all we do. I don't go to Masada, I don't go to the Dead Sea, I don't go parasailing, I don't go parachuting, I don't do most of these things I don't do. Maybe one day I should try them. That's a whole different story. It's never too late, right? But the reality is, the metziyot is, that Eres Israel Kedusha Mikol Ha'araso. And that is the reason, to a certain extent, why sometimes we find or we hear some information coming from Israel that we're not really happy about it. But we understand the reason why, to a certain extent. 
because in Eretz Israel, the Yeser Ara, that's the bottom line, wages a war because of the Kedusha that exists in Eretz Israel. You follow? But the more Kedusha, the more sanctity and holiness, the more he's going to try to this to 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 diminish that level of holiness, and that's why he says that a person should pray for Eres Israel. The same way the Mishnah tells us, "Heve mitpalel bishlova shel malchut." The Mishnah in Pirkei Avot writes, and it says, "Pray for the welfare of the government, any government. Doesn't matter in the country that you are in. You told me from Colombia, right?" A leftist, yeah. right? It's 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 you know running for the second uh, second round of the elections. The first one was not definite. They do it now. The second, and somebody told me yesterday that in one of the interviews they asked him from history, who do you glorify as your mentor and as your best teacher? And you know the answer that he gave, right? You know the answer. No, a bit after. After Stalin. During the Holocaust. Yes. Yes. This is the madness that we are in the world. What happened in, 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 in Texas the other day? Also, mega tragedy. What happened in Florida two days ago? Baruch Hashem, nothing happened. They caught the child, 10 years old, threatening with a mass shooting in school. Do you understand? 10 years old? We don't understand. And it's a lot of questions that we have, and we don't have a lot of answers. And this is not the forum to discuss these unfortunate tragedies, but when the Mishnah says, pray for the welfare of the government, and you know what is the second part of the Mishnah says? That if people will not be afraid of the law of the land, they will kill each other alive. That's the meaning of that sentence. So when we pray for the government, we have all these things in mind. That we live in a normal society, and we as Yehudim are able to live and to flourish in the most beautiful way. Now, I'd like to, with your permission, uh, switch the topic and to start talking a bit about Shavuot. At the end of the day, we have today, tomorrow, and Friday. We have three day Yom Tov. And therefore, we're going to try to catch up as much as we can. Today, it's a very special day in the Jewish calendar. Today, it's known as Yom HaMeyuhaz, the chosen day. What does that mean? Today is the day that Hashem says to the Jewish people, Be'atem tiyuli mamlechet kohanim begoi kadosh. And today, you shall become for me a nation of Kohanim, and a, a kingdom of Kohanim, and a holy nation. So when many times people say in history, the chosen nation, today was the day that the name, the chosen nation, was patented. Patented in the Torah. Yani Borea Olam says, you and I, forever. No divorce, never. Talking about the collective relation between God and the Jewish people. Now, from now tomorrow we have uh, the, today is the second of Sivan, right? So we have the third, the fourth, and the fifth of Sivan. These were called in history Sheloshet Yame Hagbala, Yani three days of separation, three days of uh, preparation. So I'd like to go uh, very quickly about some of the fundamental traditions of Shavuot to really have a better understanding of what the holiday is all about. So it says, 
First of all, the Gemara writes in Masechet Shabbat that when, maybe I go a step back, the Torah was given in Mount Sinai, correct? Now, why the Torah was given in Mount Sinai? And I don't mean the hospital, but you know why Mount Sinai hospital, it's called Mount Sinai? Because when the Torah was given, every sick person was healed. So Mount Sinai is connected to healing, to the Fu'a Shelema. That's the reason why the Mount Sinai hospitals are called Mount Sinai. They knew that. Of course they knew that. Like the apple from the apple farm. Like Yahu Hashem's name. And others. So of course they know. Now, Mount Sinai, Har Sinai by itself, was the less popular mountain among the mountains in that area. It was so simple, Mount Sinai, that Mount Sinai was the only mountain in that area that no nation ever utilized it for idolatry. Usually, when they look for mountains to offer offerings to the idols, they went for the tallest, for the widest, the most symmetric, the more elegant mountain. And Mount Sinai was none of the above. It was short, it was dry looking, and that, in a way, it preserved the purity of the mountain, which I recall reading, but since I don't remember this vividly, I'm not going to speak about it, how mountains become mountains. Well, suddenly somebody decided, I'm going to build a mountain today, I'm going to build a mountain with my name. No. So how mountains did become mountains? And oh, what, well, there is no upgrades in the mountains department? So it seems to be a godly reaction in the relationship between the water and the earth, especially between the rain aspect. And that's how mountains develop height and width and essence. So it says, the tradition is to put <coughs> beautiful flowers and roses in the synagogues and in the uh, homes to remind ourselves that when the Torah was given, not only Mount Sinai developed this beautiful floral garden, so to speak, but the world was filled with the scents of flowers. And it brings a pasuk here, on this matter, additionally, uh, there is a Nole Gemara that says that in Shavuot, we are judged on the fruits of the trees. So that also has to do with the growth and uh, development. And it says that it brings here different sources of great Talmidei Hachamim that they, they reinforce this concept, starting from the Hida from the Lebush, the Magen Abraham, and many other rabbinical sources in this particular uh, matter. And there are more, you have Rabbi Haim Palachi, Rohaim, Ben Isachar, etc. Needless to say, that in this year, because Shavuot begins on Mosai Shabbat, so all the flowers and all the cutting and all the setup needs to be done before the beginning of uh, Shabbat. Now, because, and I'm going to repeat one more time, because Shavuot happens to be on Mosai eh, <coughs> Shabbat, the halakha here is a known halakha that says that a person needs to make a lot of preparations before Shabbat begins. Why? Because once Shabbat started, you are in Shabbat mode. And you're not allowed to prepare from Shabbat to Yom Tov. So you can do a lot of things, 
uh, to celebrate the Shabbat, but matters related to Yom Tov, we take a break until the holiday begins, which is only after when Shabbat finishes. So one question was asked about the concept of taking a nap on Shabbat to stay up through the night of Shavuot. Are you allowed to do that? Or is preparing on Shabbat for Shavuot? So the short answer is to keep everybody happy. You're allowed to take a nap on Shabbat afternoon, but don't say, I'm going to take a nap so I'm able to stay up tonight. Don't say that. It's like you saying in the winter break, I'm going to take a nap Shabbat afternoon so I can drive to Orlando tonight after Shabbat is over. You know, even though that thought may cross your mind, keep it to yourself. As long as the word did not come out, you are protected, you are uh, covered. One more thing that the Ha writes is make sure to prepare extra candle on Erev Shabbat. Why? Because we are going to be needing the candle, the fire, the pre-existing flame to light the candle on Saturday night, which is Shavuot. Because on Yom Tov, you're not allowed to create new fire unless you take fire from the pre-existing flame. So the most common, the most common tradition is to go to the kosher supermarket, buy a three-day Yom Tov candle, which they are available, light it on Friday afternoon, and most likely you will have the fire accessible. Mosei Shabbat and Sunday night, which is the second and final night of the holiday. This is only matters of a uh, precaution. Also, we know the very famous tradition that the Ha writes of eating dairy items uh, on Shavuot. And I, I believe I said this in the Spanish class yesterday, not in the English class. Why specifically in Shavuot, the tradition is to have dairy items. There are a few answers, but we're going to learn a deeper answer today as well. The basic answer is, the Torah was given to the Jewish people on Shabbat. That's when Shavuot was. The Torah was given on Shabbat. In the morning, okay? Not Friday night, Shabbat morning. So what happens? Once we receive the Torah and we learn the laws of Shehita, that before you eat meat, you need to slaughter the meat, and after you, the beef, the animal rather, and after you finish, you have to kasherize the meat. All of the above are not allowed to be done on Shabbat. So therefore, no more meat until Shehita was able to be done, so to speak. I'm not telling you that they had rib steaks in the desert. Maybe they didn't have any of the above because we had the manna. The manna had all kinds of flavors. But the alaha became. So therefore, in order to commemorate the loss of kashrut, the tradition is on the morning of Shavuot to have dairy. And we cannot forget about the meat. Why? And the alaha says it very clearly. Because... <coughs> it's Yom Tov. And Yom Tov, you have Simcha. You have the concept of happiness. And happiness is with meat and, and wine. And it says, Misvale echol basar behema o basar of And it says, A misva in the holiday to add meat or chicken and to drink a little bit of wine, etc. Because at the end of the day, it's the holiday. And for that reason, we also, in the October of Shavuot, when we make the Hamotzi, we also need to have two breads, like you do in any Shabbat, right? Any Shabbat, you make Hamotzi on how many pitas, how many breads, two. So in October, specifically Shavuot, we need to have two. Why? Because the Korban of Shavuot in the Bet HaMikdash was called Shete Halechem. Two loaves of bread with matzah was offered in the Bet HaMikdash. So therefore, we have two breads. I will talk about the matzah in a few moments. 
And it says uh, that also the manna or the man in the desert did not come down on Shabbat or Yom Tov. So meaning to say that the, eve, the enemy Yom Tov, we got double portion of the manna. If we got double portion, then it requires to have Lechem Mishneh. Now, the Torah is nourishing like the milk. A baby is born, the first food that a child drinks is milk, correct? So we were considered a new nation when the Torah was given. Also the word halab, numerical value 40, the 40 days that Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Mount Sinai and came back with the tablets 40 days later. But I'm going to share with you a fascinating Ramah. And it says as follows. What is the source of milk? I'm going to tell you. The original source of milk is blood. Hashem makes a miracle. And that's why a lady that is nursing doesn't have a monthly cycle most of the time. Why there is no monthly cycle if the wife is nursing? Short answers, this is Shukhan Aruch, because Hashem makes a miracle and, 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 and reverses the blood into milk. Heavy. Heavy. But listen now, the Kabbalistic angle. So it says as follows. Remember, in the beginning of the days of the Omer, we quoted a Hida that says that ladies don't do the Omer. They don't count with a Beracha like men have an obligation to do. And the Hida explains the reason why the ladies are exempt of the Omer, not only because the Mizvah of the Omer is actually a Mizvah that has a specific time frame and we know already that is vote that have a specific time frame, ladies are exempt, but ladies have their own counting. This counting is called Shiva'a Neki'im, the seven clean days that the wife counts prior to go to the mikveh, correct? The cycle comes, stays for a few days, and then the cleaning of the counting of the seven days begins. So says the Hidab, and to reinforce it, based on Kabbalistic writing, the seven weeks of the Omer, each day of the each week of the Omer represents a day of Tahara, like the wife. And it says, once we finish the seven clean days, what the wife does, she goes to the mikveh. So we also went through the mikveh through the celebration of Shavuot. And the same way that the blood is removed and now the body produces milk, also the deen, the judgment, reverses into purity because the red color is the color of judgment. And the white color is the color of purity and holiness. That's why in many religious circles, they don't wear God, ladies especially, garments with the red color because that is a color connected to deen, to judgment. And in many, many congregations in Kippur, how people dress in white. Why? Because white represents Kedusha and Tahara like the milk. I added this simply just to create a fascinating awareness. Hacham Obadiah Yosef, Allah Shalom, as well as many poskim say the following. It says, it's a beautiful tradition in Shavuot to have dairy. We don't ignore that. It's a, a nice tradition that is for generations. It's a minhag that has been lacked in, in Israel. But two things. 
Let's say that a person doesn't like milk. He's not obligated to force themselves to have milk or dairy. Or what happens if somebody has lactose intolerance, right? That's fine. But what the Alakha reinforces is make sure to observe the loss of kashrut between basar and behalal. In other words, plan your meals accordingly and avoid the mixing of the milk. In other words, if you have dairy, not a big deal to have meat afterwards with your mouth, it's something in between. But if you ate meat first and you're gonna have a snack of dairy, make sure that six hours went by to avoid the prohibition of basar behalal. Unbelievable, beautiful uh, concept of הלכות. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם שהכל נהיה בדברו. It's not even a משרד רבנן, it's a מנהג. לא, לא, בשר, no, you mean opposite. לא, יש הבדל. The meat when you have meat, you need to wait six hours. But let's say you have halabi first. You don't have to wait for basar. Obviously, the Racha says, Hadahapim, reach your mouth, to hal mashiru, to create a, a, a separation, should have a mixture of basar and halab. But if the meat was eaten first, we have a takana of six hours. <laughs> כן, זה משהו אחר. כן, בסדר. זה לא מהסלב. זה לא תבשל לניר החלב עם משה שלושה פעמים. איסור בישול, איסור אכילה, איסור הנאה. כן, ביחד. לא תבשל גדיב החלב עם מוי, it means together. אוקיי. זו מחלוקת. מחלוקת. Some eat meat at night and dairy in the day because that's when the halachot of kashrut were activated. Other opinion says no, that many people had dairy at night and meat during the day. No need to create a shalom bite issue for this, whatever your tradition is. I personally have meat at night, because it's Yom Tov, dairy in the morning, then I go to sleep, usually for a bit, and then I get up, and I have some meat before I come in the afternoon to the synagogue. And either one of the meals, I do netila, because it's Yom Tov, so you gotta wash. So if I don't wash for breakfast, I will wash for a late lunch. This year, because Shabbat, so Shabbat, the old Shabbat is meat only. Only after Shabbat finishes Yom Tov, that's when I'm referring. Regular Shabbat is regular Shabbat meals, uh, etc. Ah? Yes, Minhan. A mitzvah shel asimcha, it's meat and wine. But the tradition is to have ma'achale halal only if it's good for the person, if a person doesn't like it, or lo ho'evet ze, lo tochan. Another concept that happens uh, in the night of Shavuot is the famous tikkun of Shavuot. Like we do every year, we offer the tikkun, and then we offer the prayers after or a bit uh, later, and it says in the Shara Kabanot, in the Zohar Kadosh, that there is a lot of good things coming to the person in the night of Shavuot. But if, if it's gonna affect your health, don't come. So you stay home. You relax, take a good nap. We need you in the morning for Birkat Kohanim. So it all depends on the physical well-being of the person. But one thing the Kafa Haim and the Benish Hai writes and it says, is a hair me'od. Be very careful of not engaging in divre hulin, not engaging in conversation in the night. Let's say you come to the tikkun of Shavuot, you come with your coffee, 
to triple espresso, to stay up all night, right? And then, in the middle of the tikkun, you start, in, no, you have the shalom, but the person starts engaged in conversations which are not relevant to the sanctity of the night of Shavuot. You know what the halacha says? Go home. Go to sleep, because your sleeping benefits the world. Why benefits the world? Because it benefits you that you're not talking, and it benefits the person that you were planning to talk to. I know it sounds funny, but that's exactly what the halacha says. Bekol shiken she'en ledaber lesanut belashon hara, Every moment of the night of Shavuot, it's something unbelievable. And Baruch Hashem, uh, the world today, it's not something that is isolated. Every normal synagogue in the world has the tikkun for Shavuot. For us, we have tikkun for Shavuot for the men, we have a class in Spanish for the ladies that they ask for it. We have a program for the boys, a program for the teens, a program for the older girls. Even though ladies really don't have the obligation to come to the Tikkun of Shavuot. I know, but in some places they offer shiurim. In South America and Central America, it's very common. Ladies come to the synagogue, they read the Hilim, and they have shiure Torah. But the truth is, that from the Alaha perspective, even from the deeper Sepharim, they said ladies don't need to come. But you know what, a lady wants to come and learn Torah, we're not going to stop them if it's done in a normal way. Obviously, to leave your kids alone, and in some places, definitely will tell them, stay where you are, etc. There are more Alachot, but I think that we're going to discuss this Alachot actually through the night of Shavuot. But one thing, it's written in the Sepharim HaKedoshim, the importance of listening to the Ten Commandments. There is a great concept to listen to the Aseret Adiberot in the day of Shavuot. First of all, the Ten Commandments, the Aseret Adiberot, are a combination of all of the misvot of the Torah plus the misvot of Hachamim. The Ten Commandments have 620 letters. Every letter of the Ten Commandments connects to a misvah. The final seven letters, Asher Lere'echa, are the final seven misvot added by Hachamim. That's why when, on Shabbat and Yom Tov, in the Musaf prayer, when the Hazan begins the Hazara, we sing Keter Itenu Lecha. Keter itenu lecha, the crown. Keter itenu lecha. Keter, the word keter, is the numerical value 620. So we listen to the Ten Commandments, so to speak, we are crowning a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Also it's written in the Sepharim HaKedoshim that in the moment of the Ten Commandments, or before the Ali of the Ten Commandments, have in mind prayer, for refuah shelema, for the holim, because the same way that, as I said before, that everyone was healed by matan Torah, and the Ten Commandments is the highlight of matan Torah, so we ride on that miracle that in the zehud of Shavuot and matan Torah, uh, the person uh, will have the refuah shelema as well. Uh, we have a minyan for Kaddish. Yes, yes, yes. I'd like to say one more thing. Can I? Of course. Of course. Thank you. I was asking permission. No, no, no. You, you don't have to I know, just in case. <clears throat> there is two things that you're going to enjoy. I may have spoken about this in the past, but interesting. It says uh, behind Palachi that in Shavuot is a great concept of eating matzah with the bread. You like it? You know, still go with us. 
It says, מנהג נכון לאכול חמס ומזל ביום הזה. It says, it's a great tradition. And your question will be, why? I never heard such a thing, right? Like you said before, I never heard such a thing. So he says as follows, without Pesach, Shavuot would have never happened. Meaning to say, we needed to leave Egypt in order to be ready for Matan Torah. So in honor, in order to honor Pesach, to tell Pesach in Shavuot, imagine yourself, we say the following, we would like to express gratitude to Mr. A, Mr. B, Mr. B, Mr. D, whatever, and then your name is not mentioned. You will not be happy about it, right? So it says here, Ki ba'avur ze mehila. Ki ba'avur ze, it says here that in the offering of Shavuot, the Lacha mentioned before, that Shavuot also requires lechem mishneh, double bread. Why? Reason number one, because the man did not come down nor on Shabbat or Yom Tov. So Erev Yom Tov came double manna. That's one opinion, one reason. Second reason, what was the korban of Shavuot? Shete halechem, two breads. But what else came with the Shete halechem? Matzah. Urkikem matzot. Matzot crackers. Pasuk. So they have mezonot. We say mezonot, obviously. But the way to do it is, the way I do it, is I have the bread for Yom Tov, obviously. I make a motzi of bread. And in the middle of the seula, you know, I take matzah that I saved from Pesach, especially for Shavuot. Okay, I have a few matzot, and we eat it in the middle of the Sauda to fulfill the halacha of the great Rebbe Haim Palachi, but it says one more Hiddush. Remez laguf vanefesh sheit'adenu le'atid. We know what we learn in Pesach. Hames, yeser ara, right? Matzah, yeser atov. In Pesach, one week, we evict the Hamas from our life. We tell the Yeser Ara, get out of here. Don't bother me, leave. I spend the week of Pesach with the Matzah, which is the Anava, the Yeser Atov. But one day, this will change. What does it mean? The Yeser Ara will be in retirement mode. And that's what it says here. La guf venefesh, to the body and the spirit, they will become refined, meaning to say the Hamas will not be the enemy. The Hamas will be a follower of the Matzah. So therefore it says we create this spiritual uh, revolution inside of our Neshama in Shavuot by eating a bit of Matzah together with the Hamas. I'll do one more, I will this, I'll let you go. There is many more things to say. I'll say them for tomorrow. But I'm going to say something today, because I don't want you to wait till tomorrow. I'll explain Belineder tomorrow, because it's coming in the next Sahih of the Alakha. But I'll explain to you after the short answer, because it's your turn, the Kiddush and the Havdalah are merged. And then you say, Hamabdil ben Kodesh le Kodesh. Like in Motzei Pesach, this year, Shabbat and Pesach, second night, were together. Yakne has. It's called Yain, Kiddush, Ner, Havdala, Zeman. No Besamim. Besamim, no. Ner, yes. Yes. Now comes the behind Palachi and brings a fascinating secular. Has to do with money. I'm telling you in advance. But ignore the money aspect. It has to do with the benefit. Listen what it says. Tikkun le'avon adam harishon. Atonement 
for the sin of Adam and Eve, Ba'avon Ha'aigel, the sin of the golden calf, Pegam Ha'berit, if a man wasn't careful with the Berit Milah, Sekula Lehashuche Banim, for those that God forbid are barren, is a Sekula to conceive a child, Umkarev Ha'geula, and expedites Mashiach's survival. This is an unbelievable concept. These five things are the biggest troublemakers of life. <coughs> we pay the price for Adam and Hava. We're still dealing with the sin of the golden calf. That's why we have the fast day of 17 of Tammuz. The Berit Milah department always can use improvement. How many people we know, God forbid, that they don't have children? Baruch Hashem, we all have, but how many don't have? And God forbid, and as a rabbi, I can give you a list. Not Bonet Olam in Brooklyn, or A-Time, or PUA. It's a wonderful organization that help couples. But I'm saying here, local, people that are married and, and, and God forbid, Unkarev Hageula and expedites Mashiach's survival. So what are you supposed to do with this money? First of all, there is a formula in the money. You give me the money, I'll take care of it. Relax, I handle it. So it says, Yafrish Tishrim Beahad. First of all, separate 91. You want to call it 91. 91 dollars, 91 cents, 91 pesos. 91 pesos will be five nickels. So forget about it. <laughs> right? A dollar in Mexico, 220, divided by 91, you yani 50 cents. Okay? 42 cents. You don't do nothing with that. But it says, keep adding until you arrive to the number 104. Shem Ban. So what is 91? We know 91 is the combination of Hashem's name, Yod Ke Vavke, 26, and Amonai Aleph Dalet Nun Yod. That's 26 plus 65, 91. The famous Pasuk, Poteya Hetiadecha. When we say the morning prayers, Poteya Hetiadecha, you should concentrate on the Pe Aleph Yod. That's also a Kabbalistic name equal to the number 91. 91 plus 13, because the goal is 104, correct? So you have one, 91 plus 13. What is 13 represents? Obviously, Yod Gim and Midot are 13 attributes of mercy. So when I combine these two numbers, 91 plus 13, I come to the magic number 104. 104 is the combination of two names of Hashem, 5252 Shem Ban, and 104 is the combination of four times 26. Yod Ke Vav Ke times four, 26 times four gives you 104. So therefore it says it behind Balachi that in Erev Shavuot, people already started giving me from yesterday. From Erev Shavuot, and we're going to distribute it very nether tomorrow, God willing. And it says, collect this money. It says, give it to Torah students. Give it to Torah scholars, etc. Because it's a supporting the Torah. And Shavuot is all about the Torah giving. So, I'm going to create a link and I'm going to send it to you. You can give it in multiples of 104, as many times as you want. And by Ezzet Hashem, we do this beautiful tikkun in honor of the upcoming celebration of a Shavuot. Thank you, Mr. Beida, for graciously sponsoring today's class. Le'ayu nishmat, your beloved sister. May neshama have an aliyah in Eden. And thank you, Kobe Cohen, for sponsoring today's class in honor of the Kahal Kadosh for the upcoming Yom Tov of Shavuot.